Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Bob Rubicki, Executive Director of Westside Community Services. Bob Rubicki began his career as pastor of the Visitation Catholic Church in Chicago after receiving a Master of Divinity. He spent subsequent years in the human services field and has held senior and chief executive leadership roles for organizations including the AIDS Alliance, Chicago Department of Public Health, Shanti, Youth and Family Enrichment Services, and the National Brain Tumor Society. In that time, he has also overseen complex mergers of nonprofits, their boards, programs, and staffs to better position the resulting organization to serve the community. Bob Rubicki is currently the Executive Director of Westside Community Services. For 40 years, Westside has provided clients in need with a comprehensive array of services through its mental health, substance abuse, HIV AIDS, violence response and prevention, and youth leadership programs. Bob has generously agreed to share some of that experience with us today. And I'd like to thank you, Bob, for joining thank us you, at Insight. Westside has a broad array of services. It's been around for 40 years. It's gone through a number of different phases and a number of different leaders. You came uh, basically a year ago to lead the organization at a, at a particularly difficult time. We're hitting this great recession. The needs are, are very, very big and, and getting larger. Tell us a little bit about Westside, how you found it, and, and how the organization is responding today. So when I came to Westside, I think, Mark, the, the, the tragedy was that this was a premier organization and that and it's now suffering through some really hard fiscal times. So the agency had lost, when I walked in the door, about $1.7 million from the previous year, had maxed out its line of credit at $2.5 million, and the bank had actually had a meeting with me my third week on the job to say, there's a problem here in terms of collateral for the line of credit. So we need to get more collateral. We need to draw on your reserves of securities. So the agency fiscally was really in very, very difficult shape and also was on a corrective plan of action from the Department of Public Health in terms of almost every one of its programs was being touched by this corrective plan of action. Mm -hmm. So I think at the time there was a huge demoralized staff and board just realizing it was under the weight of fiscal constraints as well as programmatic constraints and problems and issues and challenges. As you began to analyze the, the issue and the solution to the issue, um, how do we end up with, with a situation where the organization was so extended? It's a governance issue, and both in terms of communication, both upward and downward communication between the board and themselves and the staff. The other issue is, I think, just the competency of the folks that you had on, on the senior level staff. You know, were these the best choices for the best positions? And I think those were question marks by a lot of folks raised at the time when I walked in the door. And, and over time, I guess, small problems just accumulate and, and they become worse and worse uh, and decisions that are made that perhaps generate uh, debt moving forward uh, suddenly when there's an economic downturn all abruptly come home to roost. Yeah, and I, and I think for the Department of Public Health, the biggest issue for them was they looked at us and they said, we're looking at your finances, we're concerned about your cash flow, we're concerned about your corrective plan of action, can your programs function the way they're supposed to, can we depend upon you? You were a critical player for 40 years in San Francisco, what's, what's happening? So I think there were, there were issues that not only the board had and the staff had, but I think our funders had, the general public had about us at the time. How patient is, is, is an organization like the uh, Department of Public Health? Is, is this the kind of a, uh, of a response where um, very abruptly one says, well, 40 years, that's fine, but today you're in trouble, so we're going to toss you, at, toss you over, overboard? Or is there some patience? Is there, is, how, how does that actually work in, in, in that interaction? I think the patience might last a year, and that might be it. Uh, I think the ultimate... So no bailout? There's no bailouts. I think the ultimate... Um, the last card they would have played was either the head of the Department of Public Health or the deputy director actually appear before the board and say, there's a serious issue and problem here, we're going to stop funding. And for our organization that received about 95% of its funding from this particular uh, branch of public health, that was you know, critical for us. If we had lost all of that, the agency would be out of business at that point. And how did the organization respond? So you, ca you came in, you began to make these, these issues clear, and in resolving uh, some of the problems, which we'll come to in a second, um, you had to actually first expose the issues. How did the organization respond to that? I actually, the board knew about those issues because obviously when they were looking for me or for my person, whoever they wanted to replace the previous CF CEO, they clearly were looking for somebody who had a set of skills and talents that they wanted and expertise. So they, they understood the issues and problems as, as they were seeing it, realized they had failed in terms of their governance at that point. 
the t controls weren't tight enough in terms of over the CEO. I think the, the bigger issue for me was how do you then go out to the staff and have a general meeting with the staff and say, here's the reality. The fiscal reality is this. This is what happened as far as I can tell. Um, we're not casting blame on anybody at this point, but here's the reality. And as I kept saying to them, if we continue to do this for one more year, Westside would not exist. So we all need to kind of look very closely at our budgets and who we're hiring and why we're hiring and the amount of money we're spending and our expense accounts and so forth and really tighten the belt very, very closely as well as look at all of our programs because we're under a corrective plan of action. So being able to deliver units of service is really critical for us in a quality way. I think that being very candid with the staff and saying I'm going to be transparent with you, which is actually one of our values as an organization, trans transparency actually helped a great deal. And then going back to these staffs on a quarterly basis and individually into their meetings, giving them updates about where the organization was and so forth. There was, Mark, just this huge sigh of relief about three months ago when I said to them, guess what, we actually are out of the woods as far as they can tell. We're actually going to turn a small surplus this year. We reversed the deficit dramatically. The line of credit is now paid off. There's this huge relief from everybody's, everybody's face at that point. So the banks basically stepped back. They're satisfied. Actually, I think we're trying to renegotiate with them collateral requirements, too, so I think they're very satisfied at this point. Uh, the Department of Public Health is satisfied? Their corrective plan of action is out of the way at this point. They said we've passed all the hoops we need to go through at this particular juncture. They feel very confident about leadership, not just myself, but my entire senior staff. I mean, they're very, very comfortable with all of us. And I think the best thing for me in terms of my funder, as well as my board, as well as my staff, was transparency, to say, these are the issues, these are the problems, I'm not going to hide anything. This is what we're doing to address them, and I'll keep you posted on our progress as we go month after month after month. They really appreciated that. Both the board did, the staff did, and my funder did at that point, at that juncture. What I find to be so fascinating is the, is the comparison to a business organization and the kinds of discussions and the kinds of, of issues that evolve mm -hmm. in these same times. It is a very, very deliberate, well thought through, process to actually turn these, these situations around. And it's, it's not that different from a business. No, and I think, Mark, in terms of just our approach, because uh, we obviously did have to cut some positions at that point, right. is to be very gracious to the folks you're trying to, you are laying off or have to cut those positions and to say, let's look within the organization, are there other open opportunities for you? It's not just, we're just going to cut or lay off. And I made a commitment to the staff, I did have to lay off, I said this, that as soon as I know something about a contract, you will know as quickly as I do, so that we can talk about your options and where we can, where we can go with you in terms of the other positions within the organization. And people have really appreciated that. Sometimes it's been too much information. Um, we have another, another program, the AIDS program, that uh, was cut by the state, and I was notified about that. And um, they kept giving me mixed messages, but I kept trying to take messages back to the staff which of course raised their anxiety levels because I said, I think your job's gonna be cut in a month, but I'm not sure. But I want you to know that before you hear it on the news or read it in the newspaper or hear it in a blog somewhere. Uh, so they appreciated that, but they said it was really, it was a, maybe you should have just kept it us one more day from us and then come back. The problem is they would have found out. Right. And it, it destroys transparency at that point. So I think ultimately too much information sometimes is good in an organization for transparency's sake. Uh, obviously not personnel issues wouldn't be, but in terms of these budget issues, I think it's really important for folks to know the issues, know the impact, have all the facts in front of them. Uh, at our all staff meetings, for example, our CFO will actually go through the balance sheet with the entire organization and take it line by line and say, this is what this means, this is what this means, this is what this means. So can we do a raise or a quota this year? You can see we can not for these reasons. Um, so there's a level of transparency and buy-in that, that, that is quite unusual. This has not been the first organization that you have uh, been involved with that has had some pretty substantial uh, business challenges. Um, previously, you were with uh, Brain Tumor and uh, with, um, with WIFUS, Youth and Family Enrichment Services. And in both cases, you orchestrated uh, mergers. Could you talk a little bit about uh, those two cases? Let me talk about the Youth and Family Enrichment Services, which the agency that I actually went down to the peninsula to fund was, uh, was actually run was Youth and Family Assistance. Um, and when I walked in the door, very similar situation to what happened at Westside, although I knew less about it from the board's perspective because I, I didn't see all the financials quickly enough. But they also had run through their line of credit. The bank also had, had an appointment with me the second week I was on the job. Um, and they had proposed a budget on assumptions that were just you know, wrong and just erroneous. 
So they were looking at huge cash flow issues. They were looking at a deficit budget. They had no reserves at that point. And this was the same time the state of California was going through what they thought was about a $37 billion budget deficit over a two-year period. So when I had walked in the door, the board had not alerted me to the fact they had a previous discussion with an agency called FACES in San Carlos that had fallen apart prior to my coming on board. I found the due diligence binder on my bookcase, read through it my second week, and said this merger really should have happened. Uh, but I could see the issues for the other organization for FACES. They looked at the YFA balance sheet and they said, there's no way we want to touch this. It's toxic. We're just going to get dragged down into their debt and into their bad programming decisions and so forth. So what we had to do basically at, at Youth and Family Assistance was, again, write the organization, which we did. And the FACES board had to look back at our financials and say after six months, they've made a turnaround, cash flow is good, their programs are sound, now they're a good candidate for merger. Um, for myself, I was very selfish about it because I looked at the other organization faces and I said, here's an organization that programmatically is extremely sound, has the expertise I want to have I can't afford in my current organization, and has cash resources I do not have. I've got some things I can bring to them, um, but they're clearly the things I wanted from them. So the advantage, I think, in that whole situation, Mark, was that they had an interim ED at that time. And so they were very amenable to having a conversation with us about that potential merger and I got to know the board chair who you're going to interview later on today and we actually established a very good relationship so I think there are a number of factors that played out there but it was very similar in terms of this was an agency that was in dire distress we had to turn it around very very quickly both for the merger sake as well as for our funders and our government sources of funding uh, which we did and got the support of those organizations to kind of make the merger happen within a year uh, the Brain Tumor Foundation was a little different. They were flush with cash. They, I shouldn't say that out loud because they'll say I, it's not true, <laughs> but they had a year's operating reserve in cash, so they had some good resources. Their concern was that there were sister organizations both in Boston and Chicago. Do you need three brain tumor organizations? Actually, there was four at one time in D.C. Do you need all this competition for these limited resources? And patients and caregivers and, and doctors and nurses get very confused as to where to go to. Is, is this a good way to run a system? And so they had a very different perspective when they wanted to engage in a merger discussion. It was how do we combine our resources, create a more unified organization, make it easier for patients and doctors and nurses and hospitals to contact us and get information. Very different, different set of circumstances for them. Fiscal issues weren't the, weren't the predominant challenge at all at that point. Do you feel that in, in the uh, services field um, as, as a whole that the idea of combining um, whether it's in close partnerships or eventually in mergers, um, that that um, idea is given sufficient um, uh, consideration in, in many uh, cases? Or do you feel that it's, it's one of those last resort kind of ideas? I think the idea is very enticing to government and foundations. They keep saying, isn't this great? We could have less and we don't need 16 contracts. We could have eight contracts. Or we could have five providers versus 19 providers. So they find it very, very attractive. So foundations or corporations love this idea. The challenge is convincing a board of directors that this is a good idea. Because initially they'll say, oh, great, we're going to take over that organization. When they realize it's not a takeover, <laughs> it's a merger of equals, it's a very different set of scenarios. And I think the other factor that comes to play in this is actually if there's a chief executive officer and an executive director sitting in the chairs, they also could be the stumbling block to this because they would say, what about my job? Right. Uh, so I think just very pragmatic human dynamics come to play into this, but conceptually and idealistically, everyone says, this is a great idea. If these, you can merge two organizations and bring them together, partner them, they play off each other's weaknesses and strengths so they can complement each other well. Everyone's in favor of that. We can save money, be more efficient use of staff. The dynamics with the board and the, and the CEO and the ED level is usually the challenge and the problem. Is, is there also a financial issue? Because while um, uh, municipalities, while foundations, while even individual board members might think it, it, it's a capital idea to, uh, to create the uh, economies and efficiencies of scale, the actual merger has to be funded. And there is no, in comparison to uh, a business merger, there is no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow mm -hmm. where uh, margins are going to go up, sales are going to increase, and so on and so forth. It is, um, it is a, an investment on which there is a substantial return, but it's a substantial return in terms of cost reduction and better programs as opposed to any kind of revenue increase. 
And I think I agree with you, Mark. I think the, the issue when we've done mergers is finding somebody who will help fund that because they're not done for free. Right. And the legal resources that you're going to need to make the merger happen are very costly. In addition to that, you probably want a consultant to come in who's done mergers and acquisitions or before or partnerships or collaborations to guide the boards and the EDs as a neutral person in these discussions. Mm -hmm. Those two pieces can cost up to anywhere from fifty to $100,000 for a year's worth of services. And then you have post-merger integration, so you probably need a consultant to continue to work with you. That might be another $50,000. We were very lucky in San Mateo County that the Charles Schwab Foundation at that time was funding these kinds of activities. And so basically redirected some funding to us, to both of our organizations, to make this merger happen. And then Heller Ehrman, who is no longer existent in San Francisco, gave us pro bono services of basically five lawyers in this situation. Mm. So we were really very, very fortunate to have that kind of funding and pro, pro bono help for us to make that merger happen. It was actually very good. I think in the long run, the merger at Youth and Family Assistance and FACES, um, that actually was a merger that saved about a half a million dollars for us. The issue would be that if that merger, after the merger, two, three years down the road, the agency starts to grow and add positions, then some of the cost savings can be mitigated at that point. So it's just keeping a very close watch on costs that's going to be important at that, that juncture. Now, in terms of, of when you come into an or organization, how do you view the organization? Do you view the organization as a, a, an operating unit with certain outcomes? Do you, do you view it as a series of programs with an infrastructure? Do you view it as a top-down organization? Do you view it as a bottom-up organization? How do, you, how do you actually look at this complex series of personalities, um, programs, the, the interaction with the community? Um, how do you understand it and how do you approach managing it? I think a couple of things for me that's important. Um, I use Shanti as an example, though it wasn't a merger. Um, but it was important for me to sit down with the founder of Shanti, Dr. Charles Garfield, and just talk to Charlie and say, what was your vision for this organization 35, 40 years ago? What are potentials and issues that you think are challenges it's facing? What can be the upside of the organization? You've been around it for 35, 40 years. I've done a similar process at Westside. People have been around the organization for a long time to see what's their historical perspective. So, I kind of like to go back a little bit to either a founder or foundress or the previous executive directors or CEOs and have conversations with them because I think their insights are really imperative for me to pr proceed forward. The generative idea. Yeah, the generative idea and then what they see as the upside or what's the potential of the organization. I mean, Charlie was a, great, a good example. We had lunch, I think I was at the helm about three weeks. And we had lunch together and Charlie just started to muse a little bit about saying, you know, we've got the Shanti model of care which is actually being replicated throughout the world at this point, wouldn't it be nice, interesting concept, should we become a national training institute using the Shanti model? And I just sort of put it in the back of my head saying, I can't address this right now, but it's a good idea, and I've done that in other organizations, and I sort of proceed as I have a better sense of the organization. The other piece of information, Mark, I look for is a, it's a very basic SWOT analysis. And it sounds very simplified, but I actually would like to go down and drill down both to my managers and directors but to the line staff and do this together with them and see from their perspective what do they, what do they see and understand of the strengths of the organization, the weaknesses, things that need to improve, the opportunities and threats, and then start to pull the threads apart and, and bring them together for myself. That gives me the data points to say, how do people see the organization? How am I experiencing the organization uh, from different levels as I'm listening to people? Where does the organization, what's its potential? Where can it go? What are the problems? What are the issues? What are the challenges? Um, in Westside, when we did this, it was pretty apparent that we had a series of silos in the organization because we're very complex. We're doing mental health, substance abuse, HIV and AIDS. And as you listen to the staff talk about the organization, they would say we have tremendous competencies in these individual programs, but we don't talk to each other. So you can look at, it, you can look at an organization and say, this is an organization in theory, and in practice it is. It has an administrative structure and or an org chart, but they just, the pieces don't talk to each other. It's acting in silos. It's acting in silos. So I wouldn't know that unless I actually talked to people, listened to the board, talked to some of the folks who've been in the organization for a long time, got their perspectives, and then begin to gel and say, these are the challenges, these are the issues I think we're facing. And a bit of management by walking around. It's the old Tom Peters example, right. which is his name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> well, very current still. Um, to what end are you doing the analysis? If you're, if you're in a business 
then the analysis focuses on building margin into transaction and, and ultimately to increase profitability. You're not increasing profitability here. What are you increasing? You know, I think for us, uh, there's a couple things that we have to watch, which is the bottom line, which is our Medi-Cal billing. So I have to look at profitability in a, in a sense for the organization, make sure that we're, our programs are breaking even. Um, the other piece that I have to look at within an organization is what is the, what is the fundraising that is not government related to bring in additional unrestricted dollars. Uh, those are the challenges that I look at when I see the, the sort of the financials and I'm trying to analyze what's happening for the organization. How do we grow it? I think the other piece, this is a broader discussion is, and this is a board discussion, and we're in the middle of strategic planning with the board right now, mm -hmm. is to say, okay, my, my programs are breaking even. The question is, what difference do you want to make in the world in the city of San Francisco? What impact? And what impact? And so kind of putting a framework to this discussion to say, it's not just dollars and cents and units of service and widgets and counts, but at the end of the day, a year or two or three from now, what do we want to see happening in the Western edition in San Francisco? Do we want to see less violence? Do we want to see improved education? Uh, so what's the ultimate goal beyond just producing a contract and saying in the last year we did this many units of service, saw this many people and so forth. So I think that's the, that's the bigger challenge for the board, for myself, and just to sort of answer the profitability of the growth factor. Can we be stable? Can we be balanced? And then if we can do that, do we want to grow? In what ways do we want to grow? How do we fund that growth? Um, the one piece of data point that I also use, Mark, and we're using it currently in our strategic planning is the Macmillan Matrix. Mm -hmm. sort, of, sort of asking the board to go through and asking the staff to go through programs and asking questions about are they consistent with the mission of the organization? Who else is doing them? How well are they doing them versus us? Um, so issues of coverage, issues of sort of SWOT analysis. And then saying are they fundable and can they maintain themselves? And if they can, and you can answer those questions or you can't, then going to the grid and saying where does this happen? Should we divest yourself of this program? Should we trade it off? Should we close it down? Should we grow it? Should we capitalize on it? And so forth. And I, I've also seen um, some material where you, where you take programs and you do do some very deep um, analysis on units of service, how many people are served, the quality of service, uh, the time people spend uh, with your people, and so on. But uh, what, what I think is very interesting is the transfer, tr transformative uh, areas that you were uh, describing. What you're talking about is transforming the lives of, of individuals, mm -hmm. and you're transforming them in, in rather fundamental ways. Whereas business might be addressing the lives of individuals with the wherewithal, with the funds mm -hmm. to, to select their own transformations. They want a better car. They want to have a meal out. Mm -hmm. You're actually providing the basis for transforming people's lives who do not have the means. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a very interesting idea. The, the idea of bringing the American dream of, of self-transformation uh, to communities. So th the question that I have is, is this, by, by providing these services, are you um, empowering people or are you making them dependent on you to provide the services for them? I think all of the services that we do are really meant to empower individuals. So this is, again, our DPH goals in terms of how we do assessments. DPH, Department, Department of Public, Public Health in San Francisco. Uh, so how we look at issues around uh, both adults and children, there are very technical, very long instruments in which people actually have to set short and long-term goals. And the department has, I think to its credit, has said, for many of the individuals you serve, we can't be serving them for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So how do we address some of their issues, get them sort of stabilized in the community, as a part of the community, provide wraparound services for them, and then be able to walk away at some point, and if they need us a year or two or three years down the road. but not to provide ongoing services every day for ad nauseum. Uh, and that's happening in almost all of our programs. The, the most challenging one, though, would be the methadone program. Very often folks are on methadone for 15, 20 years. Uh, or our ACT program is sort of community treatment, where these are folks who are using the psych emergency services and emergency rooms in the city of San Francisco to the tune of sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. Trying to stabilize these individuals and keep them out of those types of settings is a huge challenge. So individuals are using the services, they're absorbing yes. that type of resource. Yes, and trying to keep them out of that resource by providing wraparound services to them so they stay out of institutions, out of residential care, but they can be in the community and stabilized and just wrapping around a whole series of case management services around them. So in, in many respects, that part of it is also a cost avoidance. I mean, it's a, yes. it's a, 
dollars and cents cost avoidance, municipal cost avoidance. For the county it is, yeah, uh, for the city and county. And, and in terms of the return on investment, is, is that how the, the city, um, is that how government is thinking? That's uh, how we pitch things, Mark. We, had a, we have a crisis clinic for the city and county of San Francisco, and back in January when the city was going through its budget crunch, we were notified that our crisis clinic was basically going to be totally defunded. This is, an op this is an operation that had been in San Francisco, again, probably for 30 years, um, and was the only self-referral crisis clinic for the entire city. So once we sort of heard that remark, then we sort of got into gear to talk to the Board of Supervisors, talk to the Health Commission, talk to the Mayor's Office, and we had to put our talking points together, and the issue was very clear. It's not, not just units of service, people we see, because that's not going to sell it. It's to say to folks that 98% of the people that we see we turn them back into the community, otherwise they'd be in your psych emergency service as a county general costing you X amount of money. So we became a very practical economic argument for them so they could kind of see the wisdom of saying they're worth giving the $1.2 million back to them because it's going to save us 2 or $3 million down the road. Let's say you didn't provide the services, you were defunded. Um, isn't the argument, well, let's not provide the services at the, uh, at the psych emergency, uh, emergency services as well, let's cut those as well. Well, the county would have to do that. They'd, otherwise, if they cut their psych emergency services, they'd be in the emergency room. So they, they'd be somewhere for costing the county a great deal of money. There's, in other words, there's no solution. There's no just, j just not addressing it. I mean, it you either work. have it. It just doesn't work. So, can I come back to the transformational idea for a sure. second? Sure. Because I think, as we try to empower and transform clients' lives, there's a parallel process going on in the organization, trying to have transformation, transformational leadership of my team and my staff. So trying to work on that level with them in their, in their sort of workaday lives and in their managerial lives, paralleling what's happening to our clients. And so we spent a lot of time, we just went through two-day training with all of my managers and directors and coordinators, which are about 30 people, but in a room together talking about mission-based communication and saying everything we do needs to be based on the mission of the organization, all our decision-making, all of our discussions and so forth. It can't be personalized, like, I don't like you, or I think it's a dumb idea. <laughs> uh, it's, that's not a good idea because in terms of the mission and how we operationalize it, it doesn't connect. And so having mission-based discussions versus having discussions about personalities or discipline in the abstract concept or budget in the abstract concepts, this kind of grounds it for folks, gives us a common language, transforms the organization, and sort of brings it together as a whole unit. So dissolving the silos which were so imperative for us seemingly to exist a year ago or two ago are now gone. So folks are actually talking to each other, talking about mission-based decision making, talking about how do we advance the mission together, how do our programs work together as a unit, not as separate island idea. Have you islands. also taken part of the programs and uh, reshuffled the deck, moved staff around to try and break up those silos? We've done some cross-training of staff, so they go between programs, uh, which has been great, and as folks have said that. We also have done a number of things. We're actually starting to buddy staff up so that they see each other's divisions and actually get to know that their counterparts in another division so they can actually call them. I think the challenge for us are more the line staff because we have 165 employees, so it's the other 130 employees who can turn over pretty quickly. How do they feel comfortable calling another program to say, do you have an opening? Can I bring a client over today? That's a bigger challenge for us. The, the group of 30 is a little easier to work with at this point. Could you describe uh, a little bit about um, how you feel the needs of the city are evolving uh, through this time and into the future, and how organizations like Westside, perhaps Westside, but organizations like Westside, and perhaps the community ought to respond to those evolving needs? Mm -hmm. I think the challenge for San Francisco, Mark, is just the changing demographics. Uh, you know, we are predominantly an African-American-based focused organization. That population has dwindled in San Francisco from 12 or 13 percent of the population a matter of 10 years ago down to less than 6 percent and going down even further. So the changing demographics, are, I think, are creating dynamics within all of our organizations, like how do you adapt to this and, you know, what's the new populations coming in and what are the services they need. And for us, the, the rising population in San Francisco is the Asian community. It's not our level of expertise. So as an organization, what do we do about that? You know, do we start to adapt to that and so forth? So I think that that's one challenge for us as we, as we look at the face of San Francisco. Um, I think the second challenge is going to be, and I think an issue for everybody, and I said this to the Chamber of Commerce, is the issue of homelessness in the city. Uh, I know we're trying to cure it by care not, care, not cash. Has it done a good job? Some folks would say it has, it hasn't. 
Um, it's putting a huge burden on a number of residential programs, both mental health and substance abuse. So I think the challenge for the city is going to be, as it tries to care for people and be humane, how do you continue to work with that population, which hasn't decreased at this point. It's basically been stabilized. The other issue, I think, and this is, again, I think as the city changes, this may disappear, this may not, but in particular in the Western Edition and in Baby Hunter's Point and in the Mission, a whole issue of gangs and violence and trauma that those violent acts cause upon families and individual students and youth and so forth. That's a huge challenge to the city. And until it comes to grips with that and its homelessness problem uh, and its educational system, I can go on and on with all of this, right. it's, it's going to be a huge challenge for the city. Is the, is the challenge, uh, you, you believe, more uh, located in a particular um, population in terms of, of um, youth versus um, versus people of, of middle age or, or, or older, or is it um, uh, uh, men uh, versus women, or is it, um, a, is it geographically uh, localized in the city? I think the problems tend to be geographically localized in the city. Um, South of Market area where I live right now is, is certainly a hotbed for some of these issues we're talking about. The Western Edition, Baby Hunters Point, the Mission District, the Visitation Valleys, these, these are different ish areas of the city that are experiencing these kind of grips of violence and so forth and poverty. Um, you're not going to find these same issues in Pacific Heights. And if you do, the issues are going to be somebody can afford to pay a, a therapist to actually do the work with that particular person. You're not going to find that in Bayview Hunters Point or in Western Edition and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the uh, geography of need um, in, in the city. Um, we had previously talked about the, the idea of localized need. Could you just give us a, a little bit of a geographic orientation of where the need exists and what type of needs exist in, in different parts of uh, the city. Uh, San Francisco? Certainly in the Western Edition where our agency is based, and I think one of the questions you'd asked earlier, Mark, was just, you know, what's our focus? Is, is it citywide or is it the Western Edition? The agency was basically founded to serve the Western Edition. And then its programs spread out to the entire area. So I think the challenge in our strategic planning is, what's our vision for the future? We want to continue to expand and so forth. And how do you do that? And are we all on the same page when we go through with that? I think in the Western Edition, just as an example, I think for us, the, the largest set of issues will revolve around the public housing developments that are in that part of the Western Edition. And gang violence is certainly a huge issue. Uh, violence and general homicides are uh, substance abuse, mental health issues that are sort of the trauma caused by violence, uh, poverty, that's a huge pocket of issues for that particular community. Also HIV and AIDS would be also an issue for that particular community. Those issues could be the same, very same things if we down, go down to Baby Hunter's Point. Uh, what's interesting about both neighborhoods is they're both in transition because of being gentrified. Right. So some of the problems are just disappearing because places are being taken off the map at this point or blocks are being eliminated. But those are the heavy concentrations of issues. In our citywide programs, what we notice, Mark, is that pretty much, for example, the crisis clinic, a pretty broad section, almost we'll get clients from every part of the city. They will predominantly come much more from the Western Edition, Baby Hunters Point, the Mission, uh, Visitation Valley for mental health substance abuse issues. But they will come from every part of the city. It's just that the level of number of people who come into the crisis clinic is smaller from, for example, the Sunset or the Richmond area. Right. And, and as you move forward and you try to shape your services around the needs, the evolving needs of San Francisco, how, how does that process look? And, and where are you in that process? I think, you know, at least I could tell you where the department, the Department of Public Health seems to be moving and some of their issues. And I think this will come out in the care not cash issue also, is that this, the, the uh, Department of Public Health spends a lot of money on its residential care. If you look at its overall budget, it's about I'd say at least 40% is going into residential care of some sort, either mental health or substance abuse. And I think the challenge for the department and the challenge for us is how do you actually, in terms of budget cutting, budget type budgetary times, those budgets are going to be impacted by constraints of taxes and so forth and revenue for the city. So in terms of addressing those individuals who go into residential care, how do you provide better wraparound services and keep them in the community and stabilize that way? I think our, our thrust would be to go that direction because we're not doing residential care at this point. There are some people who have to definitely be in residential care for, for some mental health and substance abuse, uh, but there are many individuals who might be using those particular facilities as a place for housing, and mental health happens to be an issue for them, or substance right. abuse happens to be an issue. 
those, those particular people probably are best placed back in the community with wraparound services. And that's kind of our focus as we move forward with our own planning and our own ideas of this. So it's, it, it's, it's more of the wraparound services, the diverse services within the uh, geographies that you wish to focus in, and, and you select those geographies based on the expertise that you have developed. Yes. And in the Western Edition, you know, a brand new program that we just started through our supervisor gave us some additional dollars for this. But in particular, working with organizations who actually have inroads into the house, public housing developments of the Western Edition and providing case management and mental health services for those particular youth who are in those communities looking for assistance, looking for help. So there's been some creative things we've done that are localized within the Western Edition and then some larger things with our crisis clinic that are citywide. It's an incredible, incredible series of activities that you're engaged in. And, and it is so wonderful that you've been able to, with your team and the board, turn the organization around and ensure that this organization that has served the community mm -hmm. so well for 40 years continues to provide mm -hmm. the services that you do. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your insights. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark.